brother. Maybe it's just as well. Your guitar was out of tune. That acapella was good. Amen. That was good. That's a song that has power, folks. It has meaning. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. I really am. I love the church of God. And I pray that I'm here when the church of God goes up. If I'm not, whether here or there, I will be with the Lord. I know that for certain. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Timothy with me tonight, please. 1 Timothy. Verse number 12, chapter 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy. This is what's called a pastoral epistle. The reason for that is because it's not addressed to a church like the preceding book, for example, is addressed to the church of Thessalonica, to the Thessalonians, or the church of Colossae or Ephesus and so forth. But it's a, it's a what's called a pastoral epistle. And uh, in verse number 12 of chapter 1 of the book of 1 Timothy, the scripture says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. That's his call. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Now note carefully, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Bless this word, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul makes some powerful statements in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. The kind of things that you have, to look, you have to look very carefully at to see exactly what he's saying to us. Verse 12, it's obvious that's his call. The Bible says that he put him into the ministry. I want you to think very carefully tonight about the fact that here was a man who was trying his dead level best to destroy the church. And if he had succeeded, of course he couldn't, but if he had, he essentially single-handedly would have wiped out that early New Testament group of believers in that first century who were followers of the way. This was before they were ever called Christians. They were called Christians first in Antioch. But they would have been wiped out by the zeal of Saul of Tarsus. And he was full of zeal. And he thought he was doing God's service. But the very one that Satan tried to use to destroy the church of God, God used to build it. And that shows you the wisdom of God and the providence of the Lord. Don't ever judge anything before it's time. Amen. That's a little bit of wisdom that you learn down through life. Don't be so quick to judge things. Don't be so quick to categorize everything. And don't be so quick to think you have it all figured out. Because a lot of times what is on the surface that appears on the surface sometimes hides a much, much, much deeper issue. The Apostle Paul said in verse 13, though, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Why? Now note carefully. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. If you've ever read the book of Acts, 
you'll know that Stephen, Stephen was stoned to death for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stoned to death. And the Bible says that they laid their coats down at the feet of a young man. And that was Saul of Tarsus. And But before they stoned Stephen, if you've ever read that history, that account in the Scripture, Stephen recounts to them, to Israel, their history, and reminds them how that they have resisted the Holy Spirit, and reminds them how that their fathers and they were guilty of resisting the Holy Spirit and turning away from the light. And Stephen preached the gospel to them. He preached the truth to them because he wanted it to be his final testimony before he left this world. He wanted them to know where he stood and what he believed. But they stoned him to death. So now the Apostle Paul says that I did what I did. I did it in ignorance. He persecuted the church in ignorance. Now was he ignorant of the gospel? Or was he conscious fully of what had been preached by Stephen in the book of Acts? I want to make you think tonight. Of course he was conscious of what Stephen had preached. He heard what that young man said. So what is he talking about when he said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief? And it's very important tonight to understand that, uh, that God Almighty is the judge of men and not man. And I'm glad for that. I am glad that it's not man's judgment that I stand before God, but it's God's judgment. And I know that he that searches the hearts and the reins, and he knows what you can't even, con you can't even conceive. You, can't even, you have no concept of it. But God, when he judges, he judges righteous judgment. I'm glad for that. I'm glad, thank God, that the Word of God has the answer. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 12, in verse 31, it says this, Wherefore I say to you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. He introduces the Holy Spirit. Now, probably most Americans have heard of the gospel in some form or another. They're not really that ignorant of the gospel. And probably everybody in this country, there may be a few left, but probably about everybody in this country has heard the name of Jesus. They've heard the name. And so when the Apostle Paul says that I did it ignorantly in unbelief and God gave him mercy, what do you suppose he's talking about? In Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 4 it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. Now did you get this? who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, <clears throat> tonight we're not going to get into trying to explain all that's happening in Hebrews. But to give you a basic understanding of it, as I understand it, the Hebrews were uh, Hebrew Christians coming out of Judaism and some of them having a problem with separating completely with Judaism and going back into Judaism and openly denying the Lord Jesus. And so whatever might be happening here is a totally different issue. But the issue that's imp important tonight is this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened. It is this enlightenment. It is this coming to the soul with light. It is when the soul receives light. Now what is light, preacher? Well, a lot of people believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the sense intellectually, but they really don't understand what that means. And they don't understand what that means as it relates to them, as God's demand upon them, upon hearing the gospel. The Bible says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is in this world to turn the light on. He's here to turn the light on. He's here to bring you out of darkness into light. It is, he's here to, to speak to you much deeper than a religion could ever do it. 
And religion has, religion darkens the truth if you want to know the truth about it. Whether it be a fundamental Baptist or a Roman Catholic, religion darkens the truth. Christ is the light. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but my, by me. In him was the light, and the light was the light of men. The light in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Lord Jesus Christ is life and light. And in him is no darkness at all. He's a manifestation of God. God is light. God's not a liar. It's impossible for him to lie. So the issue happens inside the human heart. The Bible says this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's that point that's only known between you and God. No man can know it. No man can, how could a man possibly know it? But it's a point that you come to in your life when the Holy Spirit turns the light on. And when he turns the light on, he tells you who Christ is and what you are. It's more than just knowing who he is. Thank God we know who he is, but you need to know who you are. And we're all as an unclean thing. We're lost. There's nothing sound about us. We're unsaved. And we cannot save ourselves. So when we reject that truth, then we're no longer ignorant. You're not ignorant anymore. You see the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus was brought and the light came to him. The light came on. He saw Christ for who he was, and he saw himself for who he was. But it didn't stop there. It continued to get worse as far as he was concerned because from that moment on, he remembered what he was. He was injurious. He says in the book of Acts that I thought in my heart what I might do to destroy the church or the Nazarene or Jesus of Nazareth. That's what he said. He said, I thought in my heart, what can I do to destroy him? Why did he do it? He thought he was pleasing God until the light came on. So the light is all important. This is why we preach. This is what we teach. This is what we minister in the church. This is what this is all about. It's not about teaching you a bunch of things that you're supposed to believe and then having a confirmation service over you and waving some hand across you and calling you a Christian. That's a bunch of man-made garbage. The man waving the hand over you doesn't know what he's talking about. It's a matter of you personally knowing the one who went to that cross and died for you. And the only way you can ever know him is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't know him on your own. You can't find him. You can't convict yourself. You can't be led to him. To be led to Christ is far more than just agreeing with a bunch of facts about who he was. To be led to him is to be brought to him as a guilty sinner. And the Lord Jesus is the only way. His blood is the only thing that can cleanse your sin. That's all. That's the only way. So he says that in verse number 13, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was injurious, but I obtained mercy. Mercy is divine pity. Mercy is the root of the tree that grows up in grace and love and forgiveness and compassion and the fruit thereof is salvation to the human soul. But it's born in mercy. God have mercy. God is a merciful God, long-suffering God, gracious God. And the Apostle Paul, being a Pharisee, uh, didn't know how to forgive anybody because he'd never been forgiven himself. He didn't know what grace was because he'd never experienced grace. He really didn't know anything about love because he'd never been loved. But he was real, very, 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 very religious. Yeah. Now, did you get all that? <laughs> That's a big deal. The Bible said, to whom much is forgiven, the same what? Loveth much. Loveth much. Mary Magdalene, thy sins are many. The woman taken in adultery, your sins are many. Go and sin no more. What do you think she did? You see, the Lord Jesus Christ goes among sinners. Why isn't he defiled by them, preacher? Well, there's nothing in him to defile. The Pharisees' righteousness he wore. He carried it on his shoulders. 
He manifested it and exhibited it to everybody around him. The Apostle Paul, folks, was a murderer. Yet as I preached to you Sunday morning, he said the righteousness which is in the law, Philippians chapter number 3, what? Blameless. blameless. How could a man be blameless and be a murderer? It was because of his own understanding and his own take of the law, the righteousness of the law. Here's the problem with the law. The law was never written in anybody's heart. It was written in stone. The Lord said, when I come, I'll make a new covenant with you, not according to the first covenant that I made with you when I brought you out of the wilderness and I gave you the law, tables of stone. He said, this time my covenant I will write in your heart. You see, the stone has no life to it. Though you can read it, certainly the truth is there and it's righteous in itself. But it cannot heal. It cannot save. It cannot deliver. It does not have that power. The purpose of the, of the law is to make manifest the murderer that you are, the adulterer that you are, the liar that you are, the thief that you are, and to lead you to Christ. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians, the law was given that it might bring us to our, I'm paraphrasing now, bring us to our knees and show us our great need of a Savior. That's what he's talking about in Galatians. It's a schoolmaster, he said, to bring us to Christ. So, but he lived by it. And he, uh, he would have died by it. And the letter killeth, but the Bible says the Spirit does what? Giveth life. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Amen. So the Apostle Paul said, I was injurious. I was a blasphemer. But I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So remember that. If you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit... And the light's been turned on. And it was turned on for me in 1973. Really turned on. If the light's ever been turned on and you see yourself for what you really are, you'll take off all your religious garbage. You'll take off all your religious robes, all your accomplishments, all your titles, all your crowns, all of your garbage that you parade in front of men, and you'll fall broken before the one who went to the cross and died for you. And you'll take your place as a guilty sinner like every one of us must do or you'll never be saved. From the least to the greatest, from the richest to the poorest. It makes no difference who you are. He's no respecter of persons. The Apostle Paul continues on though. In verse number 14, I like the way he says this. He says, and the grace of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord, was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That means that the grace that God ministered to me was greater than the guilt and condemnation in my soul. Amen. It was so abundant, he says. It was so abundant. The apostle wants you to understand that the, the guilt that can reside in the human soul can, 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 can build up to the point to where you want to blow your brains out. And they're doing it all the time, as a matter of fact, committing suicide because they can't bear it anymore. They can't stand what they are, but they don't know how to get out of it. But the grace of God is so abundant that God said, I'm going to save you, murderer Paul that persecuted me and killed my people, I'm going to show the generations to follow how great that grace really is. Amen. And I'm going to save you. Amen. And that's what he said by that. That's a wonderful thing because that says to me, thank God, thank God, Satan, you can't beat me to death with what I've done before because the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Amen. God doesn't save you partially. He doesn't save you in stages. When it comes to the new birth, no stages. That, sal that salvation is immediate and absolute and complete. The moment you are born again, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And every sin that you've ever committed is under the blood. Thank God for that. Hallelujah to the Lord. Amen. I remember a few years back, I was at a radio station around here taking my tapes in there 25, 30 years ago. And the announcer said, I want to talk to you a minute, preacher. And I went over and talked to him, and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I killed men in the war. And he said, it eats me to this day 
It was eating at his soul. I said, well, brother, you got saved. I said, you've been washed in the blood. He said, I know it. He said, but Satan beats me to death with it. He wears me out with it. And uh, he can. He can. That's a stronghold. You're giving Satan a stronghold. Now, the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are past, we press forward to the call, the high mark in Christ Jesus. Now, there's two ways to look at the past. One way is to let the past be past. As one man said it, there's no future in the past. Now, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a good way to say it. But the Apostle Peter also says that you have forgotten that you were cleansed or purged from your old sins. What you need to remember is that, yes, I did come up out of the slime pit. I was saved out of hell, but I'm not there anymore. But it reminds you of where you came from and the great grace that God ministered to you. This is what Paul's talking about here in 1 Timothy. He said, I was injurious. I was a blasphemer. He never forgot what he did. Never forgot it. But he knows it's under the blood. But when he said, uh, it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's not just rhetoric. That's not just throwing words around. That's not flowery speech. That's not trying to sound theological. That's the Apostle Paul saying, buddy, when I took a good long look at where I came from and what I used to be, oh, what a sorry low down dog I was. And what still resides in me, for in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Of a sinner's I'm chief. Realizing if he was capable of doing it before, if he yielded to that same flesh, he's capable of doing it again. You've got to understand that there's two natures and they war against each other. And if they're not warring against each other, then you, you have one side is winning. There should be a war going on in your life. If you feel like that you've been, you're sanctified and, sanctified and you've arrived, I don't know where you arrived, amen. I haven't got there yet. <laughs> Tell me where you are. Because <laughs> I war. <laughs> I do, man. The old man, the old man. I go in my prayer closet and start praying. That old fleshly mind, that old mind, it wants to wonder. It wants, it wants the mind. It wants to wonder. And then I begin to quote the scripture and plead the blood and draw nigh in my spirit to Almighty God, and I feel His presence, I feel His power on my soul. And that's where the battles won or lost, folks. It's in your relationship with the Lord. That's where the battles won or lost, folks. It's in your relationship with the Lord. That's where the battle is won or lost. It's in your relationship with the Lord. And the relationship with the Lord cannot be fabricated. It cannot, and you know who you're dealing with, God. It can't be, it's, it can't be a hypocritical thing. Your relationship with God is either right or it's wrong. The righteous, unrighteous, and self-righteous. You remember I talked about them Sunday morning. So how do I become righteous, preacher? That's a good question. How do you? The Bible says that there's somebody that is our righteousness. The scripture says he's made into us righteousness and sanctification. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the answer. You mean a person is my righteousness preacher? Amen. You mean all my good deeds don't count for righteousness? No, sir. What if I sell everything I've got, give it to the poor? Doesn't matter. The only righteousness that you'll ever have, and thank God that's all I want, is the righteousness of a man. He becomes my righteousness. Do you follow me there? So therefore the Lord Jesus Christ is my right standing with God. It's not what I do is my right standing. Amen. It's who is my right standing. Amen. I wish I could get this over and it's a hard thing because it's human nature to want to do good. Right. I'm not telling you not to do good, but it's human nature to want to do good, feel good, feel good about doing good, accomplish something spiritually. You know, you've arrived somewhere, some, somehow or another. But folks, that's not righteousness. Right. Righteousness is by faith 
appropriating who the Lord Jesus Christ is and applying that blood atonement to your soul and pleading to Him to give you spiritual strength that He alone can give you. And every breath you breathe, every moment of life, everything you do, you do it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to do it through you. He is everything to us. Everything. There is absolutely no part of your Christian life that is separate from the Lord Jesus. What would it be? <laughs> Nothing. He's everything. So the only way you'll ever be right with God is to have a right standing with God. And that right standing with God is our Lord Jesus Christ who pleased the Father. And the only way that can ever become a reality to you is when you're in fellowship with Him. And that fellowship is in the Father and with the Son. Amen. And he says to the church of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's what he said to Laodicea. And he said this of Laodicea. He said, You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And because of that, he said, What am I going to do with you? What do you want to do with the church? of?" That's right. That's right. 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 So, super abounding grace. Amen. Now, I like the way the apostle put that. Because he wanted to emphasize something. He, uh, uh, in Romans chapter number 5 and verse 20, listen to this. Moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. See, the law, once a man reads the law, it's no longer comparing himself with themselves. It's no longer, well, I don't feel bad about it. You know, this is the way things are done around here. It's no longer, well, this is our culture, blah, blah. But when a man reads the law immediately sin abounds. <laughs> he said, I was dead without the law once. He said, the law came and sin revived and I died. That's what he said in Romans. When I became aware of what God wrote in the law, I realized what a guilty sinner I was. You got to remember, the law can't save you, but it can sure make sin abound. And so what happened? Well, here's what he says. He said, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you can go to death row and preach that. You can go down to the red light districts and district and preach it to the prostitutes. And then you can preach it to the Johns. And you can preach it to the pimps. You can preach it to the drug dealers. And you can preach it to the Supreme Court justices up there who's trying to decide what marriage is. Somebody ought to tell them what the Bible says about marriage. Listen, it doesn't make any difference what culture says marriage is. What does that book say marriage is? Thus shall a man cleave unto his, and they twain or two shall become, not a man cleave unto a man or a woman cleave unto a woman. Paul said in Romans 1 plainly, for that cause God gave them up to a reprobate mind. No, sir. So it's, it's, it's meaningless whether the Supreme Court defines marriage as a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That's, it. That's meaningless. Say, so why do you say it like that? Because the Bible's the final authority. This book will be around when every last one of them have drawn their last breath and gone out to stand before that eternal being just like the rest of us will. Amen. That's the difference. So it make a difference how somebody feels or what your culture teaches or blah, blah. That's irrelevant. You say, that's dogmatic absolutism. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad you see it that way. <laughs> see it the same way. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, I agree. <laughs> I agree completely. The Bible says it was to save sinners that Christ came into the world. Save sinners. Uh, here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He said, For I'm the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Right. Yeah. Ephesians 3, 8, To me the very least of all saints was this grace given to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Yeah. Well, you say, preacher, this is a false modesty. Not really. I don't believe so. No, sir. This is the truth. This is what the man believed. This is, what he, this is the way he saw himself. The truth is, the lower you become, the higher he becomes. 
the less you are, the more he is. Flesh, you know, flesh doesn't like that. Flesh doesn't like that. There's a man up there that got 12 years for having an unlawful relationship with a teenager. He got 12 years. The prosecutors asked for 10. The judge tacked two more years on. So he's in prison for the next 12 years. I did a little survey. I thought to myself, let's see what people say about this. Almost without exception, he got what he wants. He got what he deserved. A sorry dog, he ought, to, he ought to get this, he ought to get that, he ought to get this, he, ought to, he should have got more of this, that, just bang, 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 bang. I don't excuse what he did. What he did was bad. What he did was terrible. But you know what? I had a hard time finding anybody that said, pray for him. Pray for his wife because she suffers greatly now. Pray for his family. Pray for them. You know why? When you're not right with God, you glory in somebody else's sin. That gives you a perverted comfort. You glory in their sin. When you are right with God, it burdens you and breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. It does. It breaks your heart. You say, well, look what he's done to hurt the cause of Christ. Let me tell you something that'll help the cause of Christ is when the people of Christ start manifesting the love of Christ and forgiveness and mercy and grace, considering thyself also. You see, if you'd never minister grace, you can't receive grace. If you don't minister mercy, you can't receive mercy. If you don't minister love, you can't receive love. I don't condone what he did. There's no, there's no condoning it. When the Lord Jesus said to the woman taken in adultery, he didn't condone her. He called what she did sin. Didn't he? Go and sin no more. He called it sin. But you see, his response to it was completely different than the Pharisee. They wanted her stoned to death. He forgave her and showed mercy. This man sitting up there in prison now for the next 12 years, been up pastoring one of the biggest churches in the country, led so many people, so many people to the Lord. And now I wonder how many of his friends who warmed up to him for promotion, because he was a powerful man at one time. He could open a lot of doors for people. I wonder how many of his friends who warmed up next to him during that time while he was powerful and so forth have evaporated and disappeared. Now, whatever you might think of Billy Graham tonight, and I don't know if you know much about Billy Graham. He's one of the most well-known evangelists in the country. There's one thing that man did that impressed me greatly. You know what it was? You remember Jim Breaker? Do you remember the PTL club? Do you remember his fall? Do you remember the millions involved? Do you remember the tryst with so-and-so and all this other stuff, accusations? He wound up going to prison. Jim Baker was locked up in a slammer. He was in prison, sitting in a cold cell. I don't know if he'd ever met Billy Graham in his life, but Billy Graham showed up out of the clear blue at the prison. Usually you have to call and get an appointment to go visit, but since it's Billy Graham, <laughs> you know, they let him in. He wanted to see Jim Baker. He went in there and he visited with Jim Baker. He prayed with Jim Baker. And, uh, and uh, according to what Jim Baker says, he offered Jim Baker a place to stay when he got out of prison up in the mountains, some place that he could, he could have up there. He offered him that. Now, what did Billy Graham gain from that? Notoriety? Well, everybody knows who he is. What did he gain from it? He went out of his way to go to prison and, and, and help a man who admitted by his own book that he was wrong. Jim Baker wrote a book that said, I was wrong. Now, folks, there's a lot of things about Jim Baker to, to this moment that I don't necessarily agree with. But when I see love and compassion, Amen. when I see love and compassion, yeah. I note it. I really do. I note it because there's so much absence of it. 
If you ever did fall, if you ever did fall, if it ever happened to you, you say it would never happen to me, then you're self-righteous. Let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed. Because you could fall. You could fall as a product of somebody lying about you. You could be innocent and you could be accused. A lot of things can happen to people and you could fall. Would anyone come to you and offer a Christian hand of love and mercy to try to help restore you? The scripture says, you that are spiritual, restore such an one. Not ye that are loud, not ye that are, think you're spiritual, but ye that are spiritual, you know, not ye that uh, have been approved and recommended and uh, honored and received by all the men and, and all the accolades laid upon you and you're the greatest thing in the world. No, you'll find that that spiritual man or that spiritual woman will probably never say anything or never even acknowledge anything in that nature. They just pray and quietly go about their lives, but they're there, they're there, they're there, they care. And if you ever did fall, <clears throat> I pray you don't, but if you did, if you did, then it would be good if someone came like that and helped you. Now, a son, or the son, I guess, who is notorious in this country, and I'm naming names, but you do a little research, you can find out who I'm talking about, who has been from church to church and has broken more homes and has, God only knows how many, how many, situations he's had with women. Uh, he was approached one time and said, uh, what do you think? What do you think? You think you can just do this? I mean, live like this and call yourself a preacher? Here's what he said. He said, great men have great needs. Let that settle in for a minute. Okay. Has the light been turned on for him? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the light was turned on, then turned off. And then he was turned over to a reprobate mind. That's up to the judge. I'm not the judge. That's up to the judge. But that's the answer they got. Great men have great needs. First of all, he thought he was great. And then secondly, he justified what he did because he was great. Did what Solomon do? Did, did what Solomon did in the Old Testament? Was that right? All those wives David had. Was that right? You know what the Lord said in the Book of Matthew? He said it was not so from the beginning. Male and female created He them. One man, one woman. That's the way God made it. He tolerated a bunch of garbage in the Old Testament, and one of the reasons that He tolerated it is because not a one of them were born again. That's one of those salient foundational doctrines that if you get a hold of that and really get to understand what I'm talking about, the new covenant was not ratified till Christ died on the cross. The new covenant is the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus. Nobody could be born again without the blood of Christ. That's utterly impossible because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that they had remembrance year after year after year of those sins they committed. Their, con their conscience never was completely clean. They had to bear that guilt. But when Christ went to the cross and paid for the sin debt of mankind, you have a clear conscience and you can draw nigh to God. The great men have great needs. It'd be interesting. Well, I'll say this. I have to confess this tonight. I don't know if it's a confession or not, but I'm starting to pray for this man. I have to. I have to. I pray for him. I pray for his wife and his family. Never met him. Never, probably never will, but that's not important. That's not important. For some strange reason, he's burdened me down with what that man did up there and the 12 years he got. And so when I go into my closet, I call his name out to God and I pray for him. I pray for him. And I have great peace in doing that. I pray for him. And I pray for his wife. I pray for his wife. And his, uh, I think they got children, his family, you know, whoever loves him, whoever's involved in this, whoever got hurt here. There's always more people get hurt than just the, the perpetrator. But I pray for him too. I pray for God to help him and turn the light on. I pray for God to come to him. I would want that for me, wouldn't you? Jesus, in thy name we pray. And for Jesus' sake I ask it that you bless the word tonight. 
my Heavenly Father, to the souls of the people. And Lord, I've spoken of people, Lord, real people, real people in this world who live real lives, Lord. And some of them have messed up greatly. Heavenly Father, I don't know if they're completely deceived. I don't know. I don't know if they're born again. I don't know, Lord. I'm not the judge. But I do know that you can come to them. And I know you can help them. And that's what I pray for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.